Hi, my name is Francis Vitanti. I named the studio after myself, like David said. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about new manufacturing technologies, new paradigms in manufacturing. And I'm not going to call this the next industrial revolution because the industrial revolution is kind of over. Um, instead, what I want to talk about is how we're creating materials and we're creating design tools for an information age. Um, this is about information sets. And the industrial age had a very particular set of technologies that enabled a very particular kind of culture, but it doesn't really resonate with, with our culture now. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is really, as a designer and as a design studio, when we work to develop products for clients, um, we really have to think very, very differently about um, not only manufacturing, but the customer's materials and what is form, what is efficient form. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about materials. Um, so this was a project we started, I guess, a research project we did about two years ago with Stratasys. Um, this is not the project, this is an MRI. Um, but what you're seeing here is you're seeing physical matter materials that are encoded through sets of images, right? Every pixel represents a certain kind of density of material. And you can isolate certain pixels in that range and you can get three-dimensional geometry that you could fabricate. But what we were wondering is, like, could we go the other way? Um, could we use that information to create material sets that might be continuously differentiating themselves um, going from one condition to the other. In this case, we were seeing if we could go from something that was transparent to something that was opaque. And could we do that with continuous gradients? Um, not having an assembly, but still getting multiple material properties. Uh, so what you're going to see here in this video is lots of different shades of pink. Um, this is a visualization of the, the machine code that we sent to the printer. Um, every pixel represents uh, either either one polymer or another, either a clear acrylic-like polymer or something that's very close to a black rubber. Um, the reason you're seeing all those different shades is that each pixel represents about 16 microns, so you have different microstructures in there that are fading from one to the other, so it's giving us the impression that the material is gradating from one state to the other. Um, this is some of the output from that. Um, you can see, well, this one's largely... Um, the, the, the dark rubber, but you can see here where it starts to kind of transition in yellow. It's going, we're going to a different percentage mixture of those two materials. And in an image like this, you can see very clearly we're fading from one clear acrylic into a dark rubber uh, that's flexible, malleable. Um, so we're getting different mechanical properties, different, um, different kind of visual qualities in those materials. And, and it's not an assembly, right? It comes right out of the machine like that. And we've used that to create articulated skins for use in uh, textiles and fashion industry. Uh, we've also used this to create color gradients. This is a collaboration we did with Adobe um, using the same technology in three different color polymers in order to create color transitions in the, sh in the shoes. Um, also, this is not limited to, to that style of printing. This is, a, this is FDM printing. This is like what you use in your MakerBot, except we're programming the tool path. So we're working directly. We're thinking about the tool in terms of vectors, right? So just like we thought about the other one in terms of pixels and points in space, we're thinking about this as vectors, and we're changing temperature, we're modulating um, the tool path, we're, mo we're moving the tool in three dimensions in order to create things that are woven or breathable. In this case, we're looking at applications for shoes. Um, so we're getting materials that are kind of like a, a knit. It's like an elastometer that's, that's giving us like breathable properties, like a knit or, or variable mechanical properties in terms of stretch in different parts of the shoe. Uh, we've applied that to a lot of different form factors. Um, and we've also used this to create textiles. This was a collaboration we did this year with, with Intel and uh, Chromat um, in order to kind of change the orientation of different fibers in that fabric to give us different stretch in different parts of the body. Um, form. So when you're dealing with additive processes, it's really different than what we've dealt with with like traditional machining processes. Generally, you after you're buying stock materials, right? The materials themselves are a kind of product, and you're carving away at that. And the more energy you put into carving away at that, the more expensive the part becomes. With 3D printing, you're inverting that. So you're tending towards high surface area, low volume parts, whereas traditionally we've wanted geometries that are high volume, low surface area. Um, these are some furniture pieces that we're working on that are currently in production. And 
you know, bear in mind, this is really an exercise in efficiency. It was like we're trying to find a new aesthetic language in that, right? There's an inversion in how we think about form. It's not how we modernists have thought about form. Um, so these porous kind of fibrous structures are actually ways of trying to negotiate that and find uh, new kinds of structures. Um, this is a dress we did um, recent, well, not that recently anymore. Um, the dress has 3,000 unique articulated moving components on the dress. So it's a flexible textile that's made out of hard materials. Um, and you know, we're able to do this because complexity is free with these tools, right? We don't have to have con continuous repetitive structures. Everything can be different. Every part can be different. Um, you can see up here it's conforming to her body. So if you were to take that dress apart, it's not like a flat, normal dress where the textiles would lay flat on the ground. They would kind of buckle and bend. Um, and you can see here how they come out of the machine, fully articulated and flexible. Um, and you know, when you assemble it all together, you get a, you get a textile similar like a chain mail. lagging a bit. So um, customers, right? So if we're thinking about products and objects as data constructs, right, we're able to go right from information to fabrication. Um, it affords us a different level of interaction and uh, kind of engagement with the customer. Um, this is a cellular automata. It's just, this is a derived entirely from an algorithm. I didn't draw this. It's just it's a simple binary rule. Um, what's cool about this for me is that nobody drew that, right? But it's still, it looks complex. There's structures that we recognize that are coming together and coming apart. Like it's, it has all the complexity that you would expect from a great work of art. Um, it doesn't look like math art. Um, these are some simulations using body scans. Um, also computationally derived, nobody choreographed this, nobody designed it. Um, they're just simula they're points on a body responding to each other by a predefined set of rules. Um, in this particular simulation, you're seeing those certain, they're responding to flat areas in the body by settling into swirls and spirals. Um, same algorithm, just slightly different initial conditions, you're getting a completely different reaction to the body. Um, and what we do is we try to think through systems like this um, in order to kind of create geometries and create products. So let's we'll let this play out for a minute so you can see the difference. Um, whereas the other one was settling into flat areas, this one, as it moves over the curvature of the body, it leaves the body and it creates a completely different silhouette. Right? So it's a different way of thinking about form, same body scan, same algorithm, just a slightly different parameter in the beginning. Um, this is a shoe we recently did in collaboration with United Nude. Well, this is a rendering here, and you're seeing this video kind of evolve over time. And what you're seeing on the bottom are just a couple of frozen states. Um, so we didn't really design a heel. We created a volume for the heel. We created a procedure, a procedure that would let us create a variety of textures or volumes. Um, and then those were then fabricated. Uh, and we're going to sell an edition of eight of these, and every one of them will be unique. Um, so nobody will have the same shoe twice. Uh, they're actually 18 karat gold plated shoes, so they're, they're quite expensive. <laughs> uh, you can walk in them. <laughs> uh, and lastly, I just I want to close in thinking about the factory. Um, so, you know, these tools are, are ubiquitous, right? I mean, they're becoming more and more ubiquitous. Um, they can be in people's homes, they can be in people's garages. Um, it kind of production power is not necessarily restricted to people with access to economies of scale. Um, this is a collaboration we did with a company called 3D Hubs. They're a, they're a distributed kind of manufacturing platform. Think Airbnb for 3D printing. Um, and the idea was that we would use their API in order to distribute and sell a product. So we would take a customer's, we'd have a customizable product, we would take a customer's data, we would take their zip code, their name, uh, and then we would use that API to find the local, a local manufacturing hub, and the manufacturing hub would sell the product to the customer. So we'd actually be in an interesting position where we would just be selling the file to a, to a local producer. It's a video of um, pieces evolving.
Um, so we started with, there were, at this time, there were only 5,000 hubs on their network. Uh, they're up over 23,000 now, um, so it's growing very, very quickly. Um, and we used the community to validate who was going to produce the best quality. Um, oh, just jump slides. Um, anyway, well, so you would design the product on the website. Uh, again, we'd use the API, and we would take all the customer's information, and we'd route them to one of those 5,000 hubs that had the best ranking. Um, all the pieces were designed to be made on desktop technologies with no post-processing. Um, so that was a consideration in the design. Like, we had a lot of formal complexity, but we didn't want people to have to polish or tumble, so um, they had to get built into it. All right, and um, thank you very much for your time, everybody.